a, uh, a keyboard, or even to some extent using pulling out your phone, swiping with your fingers, pulling out a, a, some kind of device with a screen and swiping on it. Uh, all indications seem to, to be that that could actually be going away or become the minority uh, uh, type of behavior for interfaces in the future. Is it five years? Is it 10 years? We don't know. But then I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that in the next few years, you're going to start to see uh, products coming out that allow you to use uh, very natural gestures using your voice, um, and sometimes just uh, using your online behavior to predict what you may want to do next, and then giving you information without you even asking about it. So we kind of referring to this as your body you can the computer. And of course, this has been predicted for a while in science fiction. Um, this is actually pretty recent uh, sci-fi. Uh, Tom Cruise and Minority Report, I'm sure everyone's seen that uh, before, where Tom Cruise puts his hands out and he's moving things around. Uh, going through a lot of the videos, uh, um, using it for, for police reporting, uh, which you're going to see over here pretty soon in this big uh, backlit screen. It's something that is, it's not ex exactly concrete yet, but you can see that we are moving in that direction uh, very quickly. Uh, you've got any, uh, any uh, superhero fan series, you've all probably seen Tony Stark and Iron Man and the Avengers um, reaching out, grabbing uh, objects that don't really, that aren't really there and manipulating information in the space. Um, there's uh, something I'm going to be showing you just in, in a little bit here, a uh, Leap Motion, which uh, is kind of moving in this direction. They call their apps air-enabled apps. So the air itself can become an interface for information. Um, something I recommend everybody check out at some point on YouTube. If you go to uh, search under uh, search for Prana Mystery, there is a uh, product that was demoed Gosh, about six years ago, called Sixth Sense. In front of this uh, uh, researcher at MIT, and uh, he's got a uh, something that kind of looks like a lanyard, where it's got a projector and a camera on it, and it's looking out at everything he's doing, and then projects information back into his environment. So the environment itself starts to become uh, uh, smart, and it delivers information rather than just kind of you know sitting there. Um, you look at uh, products like this, but I've got Google Glass, and you'll be hearing about that a little bit from Bill Ward. It's really moving in that direction already. So the future is here now. This is kind of the, the, the whole theme of this, this event tonight. And what we want people to do is think about, OK, now that the future is here, what does that mean for how we, as media and communications professionals, think about our craft? How do people interact with information? How do they receive it? How do they put information out there for others and publish it? All of that's going to be changing so that you won't, you won't increasingly no longer be doing that from a computer or from a phone. It'll just be in your daily life as you're walking around. Um, a few of you, a, a year ago, um, raise your hands if, if you came here for Nanito Lepena's uh, visit. Anyone? So it looks like maybe about 10% of you. That was a really interesting event, and that's when I really started to think about, um, about the event we're doing today. Uh, Nani uh, has gone on to get um, some money from the AP Google Fellowships. Uh, she also uh, just won the contest at the Tribeca Film Festival, got $50,000 to work on a new documentary film project that is very, very different because instead of just sitting back and watching a documentary, you actually you put something on uh, that we see on the right here. This is Tom Charles from Next View in the Room. Uh, Yep, there's Tom Charles. This is Tom, Tom Charles back in February with this experience. And what he saw was essentially this. You were, trans, uh, you were transferred into, it's like you're, you're transported into another world. And it's, a, it's you're hearing audio from a real event. But what you're seeing is uh, virtually recreated people who are moving around uh, in roughly the same way that they did during the event. In this case, there's a man who falls down in a diabetic coma. And then you're sitting there watching as you look around, thanks to this motion capture equipment that's on Tom's head here, uh, you can you feel like you're actually there. Um, so that's kind of one example of this idea of how uh, this this you know body responsive computing can really change the way that we uh, not just receive information, but sort of like an empathetic type of a, of a um, experience people can have. Um, when Nani did this, and I know this because I had to sign the paperwork for the insurance, the equipment was $100,000. And uh, it comes from the motion, pic the, the motion picture industry, also the gaming industry. 
in a single year, we've seen the cost of this kind of technology come down to roughly 1500 bucks. And you can actually see, if you wanted to go out and create something like what you see, you can see Lauren Covington doing, you just you get a $500 gaming PC, um, you have to have a projector or a flat screen, a few sensors. A lot of these sensors come from the gaming industry. Another, we've got a $79 piece of equipment called Leap Motion. And then most importantly, a developer's time. Uh, the real cost has moved completely into the software realm and out of, of hardware. Um, Leap Motion is something you'll probably be hearing about soon because it's now going to be embedded in every single laptop. I'm going to show that in a second, but essentially this device here, when I put my hand over it, you can see my hands, and then there are apps that are created that allow people to, uh, to really experience information rather than just um, kind of navigate through it. Um, Connect sensor, any gamers here have an Xbox, the same sensor that's, uh, that's used for the Xbox, and actually it's, it's cousin, is it from Asus? So one is like, yeah. Uh, there, there are slightly cheaper versions of this, but you can get these at pretty much any Walmart now. And then uh, with the right software, you can then create things kind of like what you'll see Lauren doing. Um, Oculus Script, uh, a, a product that actually is the super product version of that crazy head mounted thing you saw Tom Charles wearing uh, that Nani de la Pena brought out. Um, you can now buy that for $300. And that's thanks in part to a campaign that went up in Kickstarter. They got $2.4 million from people who are interested in this immersive experience. Um, so I think that the implication is pretty clear for me in my, in my mind. Um, the stuff that CNN's John King does with the election maps is about to get really boring um, because everyone will be able to do it. And so I think for media professionals in particular, maybe a few in, in the broadcast uh, tracks, you should think about, okay, what are things going to be like two or three years from now when I can go into the workforce? Um, if you can get ahead of that in your thinking, you'll be ready for, I think, what will be the next big transition in, uh, in computing and information. Um, this, ex this, uh, this idea of your body as a computer also extends into machines, where you're going to see with, uh, with Arnold Whitfield here, um, he has something called shark, these uh, shark goggles, which are right here. Um, when he flies this, he can actually see what the, uh, uh, what the drone is seeing, and he almost becomes one with the drone. Um, we were talking earlier about how cool it would be for people who are disabled if you could actually allow them to have the experience of flight you know, through a canyon or something. And um, it just opens up all kinds of interesting possibilities. Then, of course, we all know about Google Glass. Uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, students here at the Newhouse School who are working on ideas for uh, Google Glass apps. They'll be pitching all their ideas to you and um, showing you what, the, what they're thinking of doing. Um, to things like wristwatches, Samsung is coming out with something called Galaxy Gear, where uh, you can then get information instead of reaching into your, your pocket 20 times or 200 times a day, I forget what the metric was, a uh, little alert to just show up on your wristwatch. But that's really just the very beginning of this, because where this ultimately leads is these technologies will be moving into our bodies. And it's going to happen faster than you think. So on, on a plane ride back from a conference this weekend, I read something in the United Magazine about Google, uh, which bought Motorola Mobility a year ago. They're working on a pill which you can swallow. It actually uses uh, a potato-based battery, so it's completely safe for you. And it then puts some kind of a electro, it's an electromagnetic field within your body that then turns you into a pastor, which means you can go to a computer, to your phone, to any device, maybe even to a wall in the future. And it would just know who you are because you've authenticated. There's no signing in. There's no typing, right? Pretty crazy stuff. But this is the world that we're, I mean, this research is going on right now. Um, and Samsung is actually working on thought control interfaces so that you can uh, think, you know, if you think it, then it happens. So uh, the future's about to get uh, pretty crazy, also pretty cool. And now I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Frank Bioka uh, from the Mind Lab. He's going to tell us.
All right, well, thank you. Uh, I think it's great that Dan's uh, organized this event. <laughs> My role, I think, today will be now, primarily focused on the students is to talk a little bit about this concept of the body as a computer. And actually, it's something uh, I, I wrote about a long time ago, I've actually in the 90s, called the body computing, progressive embodiment. And I want to put it in the context of both what's currently happening and then what might be happening also to just in the in the uh, next few years. And I'm going to use, uh, just as an example, uh, because there's an emphasis on touch. Uh, you, a lot of you are working on touch interfaces. You have a touch phone. You have an iPad. And, and the hand itself is entering the computing environment. And I'll pick that just as an example. And I'm going to put in the context of the mind lab, and again, focusing on the students. We're going to actually have an open house, and I'll probably distribute this a little, a little later on. Where some uh, there'll be some demos of some of the material that uh, we'll be uh, we'll be talking about in the context of this talk, as well as this chance for you to experience some material. That's just on next Monday at uh, five o'clock downtown, and we'll hand out a little poster about that, so you can get involved. And we mentioned, for example, VR and Samsung. So, uh, and again, those of you who are our students, so our previous interns of the Mind Lab is now Vice President at Samsung introducing precisely these products that we mentioned. And also, too, a lot of you are interested in Google Glass. And a previous intern in the Mind Lab is created an early interface of the Google Glass. He had the glasses, he had a mobile computer, this is quite a few years ago, and now he works at Google, working on Google Glass development. So now uh, the Mind Lab is here at Syracuse and give you a chance to first play around. So part of the whole movement is to actually go from that kind of interaction with your computer, which is the earlier computer, everything is text, everything is paper, there's no body there, it's all numbers and senses. And that's still what's under the hood, is to go to something like this, where you're interacting with information, the information now is attached to your body, and potentially now it's something you can interact with, with you can touch and feel and interact with your hands. So, of course, the product of the moment is Google Glass, which is a great product. It's introduction in that category of augmented reality, which brings the virtual environment and the 3D environment into the physical world. But this is one moment. This is where we are as part of the discussion. But also, too, it's good to think about it within this context. You can think about Google Glass as, as this wave of innovation going on. And I think that's exactly what Dan was talking about. There's sort of, there's, there's sort of a near-term innovation, which is things that are sitting in the lab, emerging media, there are things that are sort of just being thought about in the design the lab, and then concepts that are being designed as well. So I know those of you, for example, are using the Connect, which is a great tool, but uh, that has been sitting in labs for you know, 10, 15 years in, in prototype form. So how does the computer enter the, how does our body enter the computer environment? And the very first part starts with the virtual hand. Now, a lot of you use a mouse. The mouse itself, this suddenly brings the body into the computer at the very, very beginning. And it's, but that interface, uh, does anyone know that was created? 1964, uh, Douglas Engelbart, the uh, Stanford Research Institute. And so basically everything was text before that, but then at some point you can grab your hand and move it around in 2D space. And a virtual hand is represented on the screen. But still, there's a big disjunct, which is a virtual hand over there. You're not really inside the screen. You're not really interacting. An example of where the body starts to move into the environment are these environments called the immersive virtual reality, of which Nana Lopez uh, started to bring into the journalism space. And these allow individuals, single individuals or multiple individuals, to interact completely with a virtual environment. And the new version of that HMD is to suddenly be part of the generation, at least the least expensive version of that. Now, when we're talking about some of these interfaces, I'm just going to introduce a few concepts, and then I'll just show examples from this on. But really what you're talking about are, two, are three sets of things that are going on in the development of interfaces. One is sensory immersion. By that I mean the interface is connecting up to the senses, the visual sense, the auditory sense, the haptic sense of touch, and 
generating force feedback forces, all of which these things are being generated. They're just basically taking the computing environment and then mapping it onto the body, of which you have a HMD that was, I mean, you have a screen that's out there, but no Google Glass, you're taking the screen and putting it on your face and then wrapping it around your eyes. In spatial audio, you wrap it around your ears, and of course, there's, you know, some of you only have very little tactile feedback right now, very, very little, and I'll just show that as an example. This is our force feedback, where you're actually having a sense of gravity. On the other part is motor immersion, so more your body gets into the environment. So for example, the Kinect keeps track of your location of your body in space, but your hand is entering the virtual environment through uh, touch, gloves, and position trackers. And of course, your voice is entering in terms of speech recognition, and I'll show you in a minute. Other physiological systems are also entering the virtual environment and bring computer interfaces. So just take a few examples. So visual immersion is one that you see in the virtual reality world, where the visual stuff is wrapped around your eyes, and with the Oculus Rift, you can have that in your home. So it allows you to potentially be immersed, and that makes a big difference in how much you can interact with information. You might be able to see something like this. Actually, you might have something like this downtown in, uh, in January. But one of the values of that, and this is one of the students in the lab interacting with a 3D object, and I didn't choose this because it's Halloween, but I thought it was really not. Interacting with a three-dimensional object that he can actually move his hands around. And why did we do that? Well, we were interested in medical imaging in this specific case, so you actually interact with uh, actual body parts as part of a medical imaging application. What difference does that make? Well, scale really matters. And this is an example of a student in the lab interacting with a six-foot character. It's kind of nice to interact with a character on the screen, but when you're interacting with a six-foot character, walking around that character, interacting with that character, it makes a tremendous difference because now that character is at the same scale as your body and then you're really immersed in that environment. In this case, he's walking around a virtual reality and this, and this uh, gal is inside the environment and he's just walking around and observing her from the side. Then haptic feedback, well, you can get motion actually to your senses and that actually Samsung, I'm also a Samsung professor in Korea, well, I'm also here but I'm not here, and Samsung is interested in generating more senses to the sense of touch. And so to have a sense of haptic touch, this is a high-end system. So it generates not only haptic touch, but forces. So you can actually grab things, touch them, and feel them inside the environment once you put in a, a display. What are the applications for this? These are not consumer products yet. Primarily, you see them in medical uh, training environments. So if you go to medical school over in upstate, you might actually have force feedback and touch feedback environments where you can get in there and actually grab and touch objects. At the same time, you want to get the body into the environment. Right? So the Kinect gets a little bit of that. It keeps track of your body, but it doesn't do hand motions particularly well. <coughs> These are two examples of systems that do different scales of body entry. And so in this specific case, this one does very fine finger controls as well as generating forces. The next one, the little ball thing, which is used primarily in military applications, one of the values of that is one of the things you can't do in any of these environments, you can't move around, you can't walk, you can't run. Well, how can you do that? One of the ways to do that is in these spherical environments where the individual can run through a large space and inside the virtual environment have a sense that, so, that they're really immersed in the environment and have a full body interaction. Here's an example of something we did with a virtual cadaver as part of the medical imaging. I just want to point out that all the senses are interconnected. In this case, the person was doing uh, some interaction with this virtual cadaver and pulling some things with their hand and the spring and it you'll only use visual and auditory things but through little tricks that we're playing the environment people felt that they touched it so I want to point out part of this is illusion so we're just generating visual cues and auditory cues and they said I felt something in my hand so all these cues are interdependent they all interact. So they felt that they actually touched this thing even though we didn't do it. Now I just, I want to, because we're talking about Google Glass, let's talk about augmented reality. Now we're talking a little bit 
more on the upper side of the curve. And this is something uh, as part of a project called Global Infospaces funded by National Science Foundation and NASA. In this case, our goal was to, what if you're walking around the environment and you don't have Google Glass, but you have an immersive version of augmented reality, where do you put the menus? Where do you put information? How do you carry all the information? In this case, you can actually see this person's walking on a map. Imagine we could create that, a map that you walk on, so you can see where you are in the environment. So imagine Google Maps that you walk on. And then imagine all your menu systems arrayed around your body. And actually that HMD on the side is part of the prototype set that we intended for that. So now we're sort of drilled down to some of these projects in the mind lab, and I'm just going to go through some that are related to the topic for today. This is the one I was mentioning, and that's the Mobile Infospaces project. And the goal was the National Science Foundation said, well, if we have virtual environments, how can we create menus? So I'll just quick, uh, give you a quick example. And I'm going to jump past this NASA one and then go, this is the HMD, for example. You can see this in Russia, so this is my colleague. This is actually an MIT version of created by Janique, who's part of our team. And this is probably what the more immersive one will look like. And she has a new prototype of that HMD, which we collaborate on. And it will be here in Syracuse in January. So you'll see the very latest HMD, the post Google Glass version. Um, and uh, over in uh, over here in Syracuse in January. So how about the hand? So just we picked hand as an example. So let's not let's play with the hands. How can you put information directly in your hands? Well, you can do that in augmented reality, so that the phone potentially is a series of numbers on your hand. And part of the trick is to actually put the menus directly into your hand. So here's a prototype where some people in the lab are playing with, which is basically the menus are coming out of your hand. So we're using basically a fiducial marker for augmented reality. And he's got a menu system, which is a ring. And the menus pop out of the hand and interact with various sort of prototype objects here for this menu-based system that has all that stuff directly connected to the body. So you can touch things. So that little baseball card, we should, we should might have a version of that a demo like that probably next week as well. So what are the applications for this? Well, you can recognize faces in a virtual environment while wearing HMD, and then superimpose information on the person interacting with. Oh, this is the last time I saw her. This is information about her. Superimpose directly while you're interacting with that person. Another application called the attentional funnel. So what if you want to navigate around the environment? It's nice to have a map, nice to know where you are, but can the computer find objects anywhere from a building to your keys? Something as small. And then we designed something called the attentional funnel to do that. And basically the computer guides your head directly to objects in a small scale. So this would be an example of that. And you can see the first person viewpoint is what the person is seeing. It's called uh, a, a, fire, a sort of potential sink. The applications you can see in this be military applications. In this case, it was funded by NASA and DARPA. It's primarily to allow people to find, them, find their way through burning buildings and fog and, and any kind of setting. And they can also be used by doctors and medical applications. You can also have an example like this. This is Google Maps, where you have a superposition of the actual objects directly on the environment. They can get really large. And finally, the entering of the body is, I mentioned another thing you can get into the body is something, your internal, your mind. And so you'll see next week at our demo a brain-computer interface, of which this is an example. And so you can control things at, with your brain. And we'll do that using an FMIR device, which is also the Syracuse part. And then finally, this is also a medium. This is an example sort of a high-end version. Uh, this is one of the higher-end simulators. That is one medium over there. That's to, to create a high-end simulation for a few people. And you can see it is you. So fundamentally, students, past students in the mind lab, uh, Stanford, Harvard, Google, Microsoft, and other places. And we'll be looking for interns next week. Uh, this is my ad here. <coughs> Thank you very much. And the Mind Lab is fundamentally a 3D environment. And so it's a little bit about the context of what we talked about. 
And then we'll stop right there. This is where the birth of our logo and the person who created that is also working in electronic arts right now. Thank you very much. We have time. We've got a lot of people to bring up here. So next up, I'd like to introduce Professor Bill Ward. Uh, he teaches social media and a whole lot of other things here at uh, Newhouse. Just pass these and around. He's been working with uh, students with Google Glass. As you can see, he's also a Glass Explorer. And um, I'll let him uh, explain this. There's going to be two different uh, pitch sessions. Um, so you're going to hear five right now. Then we'll have a little break, move to gestures, and then after that, um, there will be some cookies. Cookies for you all. Uh, don't get too excited. And then we'll have some more Google Glass uh, demonstrations. So uh, I really plead with you to make sure you watch all ten of the student presentations because they've been working really hard. So, yeah, thank you. There, there's actually 11 presentations, and we'll have five here at this first uh, presentation part, and then a little later we'll have the other six. So the people who are presenting, you guys need to come down and make your way to the front because you're going to be going up very quickly. While they're making their way down, I just want to reiterate what they're talking about. Is here we have in the last 10 years, we've gone from all of these physical devices that we had to carry around to the functionality that we now have in our smartphones, which has been the most rapidly adopted technology in history. Within five years, over 50% of the population um, now approaching 60% have a smartphone, and that's really sort of transformed how we use digital and social. And the next transition is going to, you know, these new devices, whether they're Google glasses like I'm wearing, or smartwatches, or these sensor projection systems, rings, and so on. And uh, I didn't include this slide because I didn't want to scare you too much, but the next, you know, iterations are those things you put in your body, like a computer contact lens or a uh, ear that uh, a piece that gets implanted in your ear that does your all your functions, so it's wired right into your brain. And those are probably within five years; those will be out. But um, you know, if you think this sounds a little strange, and that you know, I would never wear Google glasses because I look nerdy or dorky or something, and oh, I, I don't think I'd ever get a smartwatch. Um, I just like to have you consider this evolution that of, of man. We've gone, you know, we made it upright, and then we started hunching over again on our computers. We started to get up a little bit with our smartphones, but it's really strange watching people walk around not engaging with their environment and not paying attention and, and actually seeing what's around them. And so this new technology, although there are some issues around privacy and ethics that we all need to address, some serious ones, uh, it also can be very liberating. And so hopefully we'll become upright and free and mobile again like we're supposed to be as humans. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the teams in just a second. So I'm a Google Glass Explorer. I've had them since July. Uh, and I've also incorporated it in my classes. I have two classes, a social media for communicators, which is COM 427, and then COM 600, social media theory and practice. Both classes have integrated uh, Google Glass apps. They've all demoed the product. They've come up with applications or developed them. And they've been using social media to share those ideas out. because with smartphone adoption, what we saw is that 60% of what people do on their smartphone today was all new activity that they weren't doing on their mobile phones when they are just doing email and texting. And so what will these new activities be for Google Glasses? How that will, how will that change how people are using them? So uh, with that, each of the students have already presented their ideas to a panel of experts, including uh, startup co-founders, different experts, some of them who are presenting on the panel today, and some professors who have given them feedback on their ideas. You're going to see the short one-minute elevator pitch just to sort of give you an idea of what the idea is. Also, they'll be sharing more details in the back channel uh, on the hashtag body computer. So if you go there, you can get links to you know, the whole slide deck and the more details. But this is just a quick version to give you an idea of the range of possibilities and what they're developing. And at the end, we'll have a poll come out where you guys can all vote on the different uh, ideas that you've heard on which one you would most like to see developed into uh, an app. And so one of the teams from each of the classes will have an app, uh, a either prototype or simulation developed that hopefully will eventually go on and become a, a Google Glass app. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the first team, uh, Climb for Glass. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm Brandy, um, and I want to tell you about Climb Your Glass, which is 
of the Blue Bass Fitness app um, for an adventurous workout. It will take you off of the roads and the trails um, to more alternative areas. So if you're feeling adventurous, you can map your own route, um, taking pictures and videos along the way. Or Climb for Glass can also find you a user-created um, route in the area that suits your preference. Um, so you can use the screen of Google Glass to see and find routes, but it is full voice activation on Climb for Glass, so it will tell you your distance, speed, directions, anything that you want it to tell you. Um, it also offers a social media aspect where you have an online profile so that after your workout you can share with others your results and your new path. Um, please give us feedback at our hashtag, Climb for Glass. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I developed um, an app called iCatch, the word recognition app. It's to assist the busy, the lazy, the unfortunately oblivious. Essentially, it's going to help eliminate clutter. What you're going to do is plug in certain words into your iCatch um, app. And every time it sees your words, which you can plug in multiple at a time, it will let you know. It will zoom in, take a photo, and give you a little beep beep, letting you know it's seen one of your words. So I'm a dancer, so if I had this app, I'd plug in the word dance. And every time my eye catch saw those words, because they're glasses people, they would notify you and say, okay, your word. Here's a poster board in Newhouse. There was a poster on there that had an opportunity for dancers, and I would have had no clue, because I only had a brief second when I was walking by for class, so it's practical. It's for people living in big cities, um, and it can help eliminate clutter. It can help you so you don't miss opportunities, specials, stuff that you love. So plug in what you love, and it's a really practical app, and I would love to see it developed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robin Wilk, and we're at Lobo for Glass. So picture this. I'm walking down the street, and I see my friend wearing brand new shoes. I instantly fall in love with them. So I take my Google Glass, I open the Logo for Glass app, and with, I take a picture of the logo, and with this picture, I, and with the app, I have the ability to find the closest store they're sold at, instantly purchase them on the spot, or add them to my wish list to purchase later. This is Logo for Glass. Welcome to the next level of the consumer experience. On Shark Tank, Mark Cuban of the Dallas Mavericks said, QR codes are becoming more obsolete. This proves that now, more than ever, Brands and logos need to be connected, and Logo for Glass strives to improve that connection. If you want to learn more about our app, please find our hashtag Logo for Glass and tell us what you think. I look forward to your feedback. Okay. Hi, I'm Kelsey, and I'm speaking on behalf of Moodzik. Um, Moodzik is a mood management app that my team and myself designed for Google Glass. Studies show that the brain has the ability to act as a music recommender uh, based on exposure to music genres. This app is unique because it combines visual elements along with audio that aren't common in other smart devices. The music is categorized into playlists based on a color coding system, and the audio is delivered to the user via bone conduction. The app is an intuitive, natural, and hands-free way of selecting music based on the color spectrum. Bone conduction is ideal because it delivers sound without damaging the ear or blocking out environmental noise. This app is unique and adaptive to each specific user. For example, I may categorize a song by Adele under blue for sad, whereas you may categorize it under green for calm. All smart technologies need a music application, and we feel that music is the perfect solution for Google Glass. Um, this is also a chance for Google to improve the Glass's sound quality. And to learn more, you can follow our hashtag on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. And my last question is, what's your color? So how many times have you run into someone that you've met before and forgotten their name? Recognize solves a major problem in society, forgetting people's names. Recognize is a Google Glass app that uses facial recognition technology to detect people you're already friends with on social media. Have you ever, has Facebook ever asked you to tag one of your photos? Uh, our app is similar. While using Recognize with Google Glass, the name of a person will automatically appear on the screen. So no more what's your name again? Recognize categorizes your, your social media contacts into crowds. There are two types, interest and geolocation-based crowds. 
Interest-based crowds include friends, family, colleagues, or teammates. And location-based crowds include campus, work, or home. Please use our hashtag to let us know what you think and to find links for more information. So support recognize because everyone forgets. All right, that was the uh, first five uh, teams. You'll have six more in a, a little bit, and then you'll have a chance to vote on uh, the ideas you would most like to see developed into apps. And we'll turn over to Dan for the next. Great. Give them all a round of applause. That was really great. Thanks for having us here. So, Lauren uh, Covington over here is going to keep getting set up, but have a quick announcement. A uh, couple of announcements here. Sorry. Oh, thanks. Um, so Sean Brannigan, right over here. Uh, if you could stand up real quick, Sean uh, has a couple of classes that he's pitching. And I don't know why my screen is not working. Uh, but he also uh, he has a message to his students. There are about 12 of his students here. Uh, anybody did not sign in uh, for extra credit, uh, put your hands up so I can see where you are. I got about uh, 10 or 15 names on here, and I think four from class. So you get extra credit anyway. The, uh, uh, the class I teach is, uh, and last night we had our, our presentation, the student group presentation. Uh, we look at the future of digital media. We look out 20, 30, 40 years. What's going to happen? How quickly do we think it's going to come in? And you are, the, the students are the ones who are projecting what the future is going to be looking like. It's uh, going to be having the class again next fall. This is our, been our third year. A lot of great speakers. Uh, I don't know what else you want me to say about it. Uh, it's sure. a cool class, and you should think about it. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, and while also Lauren's um, being set up here, so I promised that we would show. Sorry about the stream. I'll walk this thing around. Anybody else need to sign in here? Yeah. So I mentioned a $79 piece of equipment that you can get called the Leaf. I have it right here. It's about half the size of an iPhone. Um, later on tonight, when we have our uh, well, the, after the second set of Google Blast uh, presentations, we'll have time for everybody to kind of go to different stations and play around. This you're seeing this is one of them. It's called Elite Motion. And what I want to show you is when I put my hand out, it sees my hands. You can see both of my hands. Right? So imagine how powerful this could be. It's not just seeing my hand. It's seeing every single joint. You see I make very, very minute uh, movements. That's gesture interfaces right there. So what's happening with Leap is that uh, developers are now, uh, there's an API that was released that allows developers to do things with information. One of them is the New York Times. I actually met the person who developed this just the other week at the Online News Association conference. The way this one works is you hold your finger out, and you can move left and right to uh, navigate through information. When you see, in this case, it's, it's the top uh, the top stories, New York Times, you see something I like, I hold my finger over it, and how do you think I scroll? Any guesses? You go like this. Scroll, scroll. <laughs> little whimsical. Uh, to go back, there's no little red X to click. You just go like this. Um, so it's uh, actually one of the more clever uh, apps that are out there. You know, pr pretty simple. You know, people tend to, tend to get it. Um, but this is something that you know, they, they did pretty quickly, from what I understand. Um, and so what else can you do? Well, thinking beyond text and photos, imagine something, again, it's like the second skull we have tonight, <laughs> French of the first. But hey, it's Halloween pretty soon here. Um, imagine that you're telling a medical story, and there's someone in the news who uh, has brain cancer, or perhaps there's a new drug to treat brain cancer. Um, Developers could create uh, gesture interfaces to allow you to not just see an animation of where the cancer is, but you could be invited if you have Leap or one of those new HP laptops with Leap in involved. You just navigate through it. So this is something else you can try yourself. It gets a little a little crazier too if you uh, hold your finger out. I fully totally expect the gas to this. 
You can start dissecting it. Oh, there's a gas. <laughs> Um, so that's that, that's the leap. Um, there are I don't know about uh, 100 apps or so in, in the leap motion. Uh, last one I'll show here is actually just pure fun. It's my favorite app. It's called Air Heart. It's kind of like Air Air Guitar. And yeah, see if we have our sound. <laughs> fully expect uh, some enterprising musicians out there to uh, go out and create the first lead pair of art concert on Earth. You'll get a lot of publicity that way. So that's our uh, segue into the gesture world. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Covington, who is the, our local expert in gestures. Um, I'd like to point out that I actually met Lauren because he came to the event for Nani Bibliothania a year ago. And uh, since we've become friends, uh, he's part of the Hacks and Hackers community here. Also, uh, what's, what's some others? There's uh, Salt uh, Maker Space. The Salt, the salt Maker Space. Um, this guy, any, anything innovative going on in Syracuse, he tends to show up, um, including putting a crate fest. So let me explain what that is. But turn it over to Lauren. Oh, you can use this. Yeah, these are fine. OK, great. I'll yell when I'm done. Um, and let me just get your presentation from you. Is that it? That's it. Okay. <laughs> Dan, put the mic on. Here. This oh, works better because you're going to walk. Yeah. We got you guys figured out. Um, is that the beginning? No. Well, that's almost there. All right. Yeah. Okay. You didn't see me yet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm Lauren Covington, and sort of one of my, I'm going to be my manifesto first, which is that we are built for interaction. Uh, we have evolved in a very complex world with a lot of other things going on around us that we've had to learn to deal with and evolve to deal with. So interacting is a really deep part of this. This is sort of what Frank was getting into it. Uh, part of my own personal uh, theory related to this then is that control is boring. Complex responses are what really enriches. It's uh, you know you don't, you don't control a film, you don't control a book that you read, you don't control the dance partner that you're dancing with. You're interacting with it, and you're sort of participating in many ways. So what uh, I have been doing, and Bill Say, the man behind the curtain over here, the two of us have been doing for quite a while, uh, is we're really sort of looking at everyday environments right now and sort of making them richer and more interesting things that are going on. So they're not like this. There's just static walls everywhere around you. Uh, you can do that by making them more responsive to your presence, to the activities that are going on in these environments. And you can make them informative as well as just aesthetic and sort of pleasing. And this is made possible. Uh, a lot of the stuff that, that Frank was showing you was very high-end megabuck stuff. This is now dirt cheap, which is sort of what Dan was talking about. Uh, the stuff that's, that's up here is, like I said, you can just buy it off of Amazon nowadays for a few hundred bucks. So the other thing is with, with the projection stuff is that you can do it really cheaply. Uh, you can sort of simulate a lot of environments by using projections. That's why most of my demos I think you're going to be seeing are, are video projections, but you can translate this into more physical entities. Uh, I've been doing my work under sort of an umbrella thing that I call the Electric Heliotrope Theater. This was just a fun name that I thought sounded sort of steampunk, uh, but was a way to describe that this is an environment for participating in a new kind of media. It's a kind of theater, but it's a very personal theater. This is an example of some very early responsive stuff that I did with some dancers. This is a performance at the Kennedy Center. Uh, and you can see the visuals behind the dancer responding to his body motions as well as to the sound that he's playing um, on the theorem, which is a non-touch, very ancient language. Like I sort of took that further by parameterizing what the dancers were doing. This is another Kennedy Center performance. And then taking their motions and feeding it into very complex algorithms that would generate what was thought to be I was hoping would be a companion dancer uh, for them that would respond to them in, in sort of subtle ways. So I started moving from there. Well, that was really fun working uh, with dancers and doing performances. They were having all the fun. 
so what I really started getting into was really first-person experience uh, for people. And this is an example of, of pre-connect days, of, uh, sort of a little washed out, you can't see him very well there. There's somebody standing right in front of the screen. So it's not like a connect where you've got to stand back. And just by sort of standing there and tilting his body posture and gesture, he's flying through this little fake solar system uh, just by walking up to the screen and doing it. Okay, let's get this one going. This is going to be a quick little demo of uh, something that Dan recommended, which is being called the reveal.js framework. I mean, it's my fault, it doesn't work. That's right, it's all his fault. Um, so I've got a quick little demo set up. There's a camera up there, which is a depth camera, which is reading my position in space. So it's reading my body, it's reading my hand positions, and things like this. And it's absolutely not, not working out. There we go. Uh, so I can stand here and more or less browse by just gesturing with my hands. More or less. So. <laughs> There we go. You can do it. All right. Well, this is being cranky. I didn't have a lot of time to set up. It's his fault. <laughs> so, um, so this gives you an example. If I can just stand here uh, with this, and, and more or less just you wave my hands. Okay. So it's it's going to be cranky with this. So that's sort of an example of what you can do. That's a hundred and fifty dollars sensor in front of a sheet. Okay. Uh, and you can make actually very sophisticated, complex environments with it. Which we will move on to. Uh, can we go to the sun? <coughs> Take just a moment to get this started. Now this is actually something that's down at the, the most right now. So this is sort of a pale imitation of what it really works like. Uh, but this is an example of real data that's coming from NASA about the different uh, information from the sun, from one of their satellites that shows you this in all these different degrees here. And the idea is, is this is the sun we normally see here. And, and the piece of this is called the unseen sun. And you can come up and you can start examining the sun in these different temperature ranges by just sort of walking and moving your hand over the surface. Uh, and then you can pick the different degrees that you want to look at in by using a combination of gesture and touch, which I think is really the future of reality with this. I mean, gesture has its good points, but then touch really works because you touch things. You know, and it's cheap and fast. It's very really easy to do. So that's a you know a good thing to do. But the problem is, as I found, is that because this stuff has never existed before, there's no habits that people have for how to interact with this stuff. And this is a totally new area that I would encourage you all to start researching. Because how do people want to use these kinds of methods together and in concert? I find this works really great once you know how it works. But when people first walk up to it, they sort of have to be instructed in how it works. So and I may not be doing it the right way. There may be better ways to approach those kinds of combinations of interactions with complex stuff. All right, Frank went over VR a little bit. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a lot of stuff with VR. This is an example, actually, of that screen. It looks like I'm walking around with this object, this, this atom, a uh, molecule, rather. Uh, but I'm not. I'm just walking around in front of that sheet. And because it's tracking me and knows where my head is, it's doing what's called a virtual reality wall. Uh, and I can walk around this molecule and look at it. I'm holding the camera to my head while I'm doing this. So you, the camera's sort of seeing what I see as I walk around it. Let's go. Uh, and you can interact in this space. This is an example of a directed evolution simulation. Call it swim with the fishes of light, little critters, that are uh, little mythical sci-fi looking things. Uh, and you can reach out and pick them and select them for breeding. So you can sort of pick out the ones you like by just putting your hand sort of out into the space where these fishes are, and then they will mate uh, according to the ones that you pick. Uh, so this is a way to just sort of move into this virtual reality and, and be able to go out and interact with these things and sort of affect what's going on. All right, can we do the restart? Now this, I'm just showing it to you in 2D right now, but this is the same kind of thing. This is actually a virtual reality tracking. You see it's, it's tracking my body. And this is called a force-directed graph, and this is real-time data taken from Wikipedia, which you can see the page here, which they're asking us for donations. Um, and this is 
sort of a tree that it's built off of looking up the evolution page and looking at other pages off of that page. And it's, so it's built what's called a force-directed graph, and I can move around and look in this force-directed graph. Uh, and it's sort of, it's, it's much more effective when you're here because it's doing it from my perspective. But you can see that I'm having an effect with it. And what I can do is if I say, well, this is sort of interesting. I want to go sort of back in here. What on earth is abiogenesis? Well, let's go look that guy up. And now it's pulled up that page and that information. And now it's showing me all the relationships of, of the terms and things related to this. So this gives you a way to literally jump in the data and sort of explore what the relationships are. You can find some really interesting relationships uh, in this. So this is just a very quick, simple demo of the kinds of things that you can do once you started moving into this space and you're just providing an information space that you can move around and explore. Uh, like Frank was talking about sort of geographically by walking on the map, except this is just a data world that you're moving into instead of a map. So what I'm working on now is the hand, like Frank was saying. Um, I'm trying a couple of different experiments here. Uh, Katie, a student here, is helping me out with this. Uh, how to get your hands into that interaction space so that you can really sort of start grabbing things and manipulating them. Uh, both of these examples were done. This is done with an Intel gesture camera, $200 camera, stuck on top of the ribs. Uh, she's wearing a rift. It's got the little camera you can just barely see on the top of it up there. And this one is done by that same little camera that's up there in the corner, a $140 camera. Uh, and running on a PC with free software. So there's no reason you can't be doing this. So we're also uh, doing artwork, immersive sort of environmental art uh, with this stuff. This, as you can see, is actually ambient video. Uh, this is a friend who does ambient video, uh, sort of art uh, video. This is from Santa Barbara Coast and Cliffs. And, but as you walk around in front of the screen, it, it, you, you leave your print on this video and your motion to it sort of affects what's happening. And here's some from Manhattan, just a little difference. This guy's really getting into it. <laughs> so that's uh, another example of what you can do. One of the key things about all of this, again, because it's sort of trailblazing, and just like the Leap, uh, just like any of the VR environments, nobody knows how it should be done. Right. Uh, so it's very important that, that Bill and I sort of focus on user-centered design, which is a process of really looking at what the user is trying to do, what they want to do, and sort of think about it from them, not necessarily what's the cutest or the neatest or the cleverest thing. Um, so because of these new contexts and these cognitive models, but, you know, we don't know what people react to when they come up in front of this stuff. So one of the values that we're doing, why we're working with the most here in Syracuse, is an excellent resource and they're very open to this kind of stuff, is they let us go in and put stuff in there for people to come interact with and we get this steady stream of naive users that we can then study, we can record data from, and actually start seeing how people want to use this new media. So that's a really very valuable thing. Uh, where we're going is ideally to roll all of this together and even more stuff that I haven't had time to present so that we're sort of putting this together in, in real, immersive, sort of whole body experiences. You know, the idea that we're looking at a little screen or doing this, that kind of thing, that's going to be a blip in history. Uh, so the kinds of things that they're talking about with the, the augmented reality glasses, with environments that sense you, because uh, I mean, you can do the VR experience in front of that sheet just by walking up there. You don't need a device in your hand to do it. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of this new stuff that, that we need to sort of explore and figure out, develop the lexicon for, figure out how it works, and really trailblaze. This is a really great time to be trying to do this stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Lord. So uh, remember, afterwards you can uh, go down and spend time with each one of these innovators and, and uh, experiment with some of the, those interfaces Lauren was showing you. Um, we were going to have a break, but actually we're ahead, we're ahead of time, which is great, which means we'll have more time for you to, to, uh, to work with, with, to talk to each, uh, each innovator, little station we're going to set up. So I'm going to pass it straight to uh, Bill Ward again, and we'll have the next six, is it, uh, Google Glass presentations?
right. If the next group of students can make their way down for the uh, presentation, and hopefully they're all here. Uh, if they're not here because they're planning to go there, we'll just have to go through the ones that are here. Um, Sorry, the, uh, we're just not getting it back up. So, um, six. All right, so we've got, um, we might have one other team here. I hope that they'll be arriving here shortly. Um, sorry. sorry about that. It got closed as we were jumping back in the items. So we've got our next group of presenters, and just a, a quick little intro before we go into it. You know, one of the things with Google Glasses is they're in beta test right now, um, but they're in process of you know launching them next year. So uh, when I traveled through the Syracuse airport recently, they had never seen Google Glasses yet. So the T TSA was sort of like, "What are those?" And I said, "Well, they're computer glasses. What do they do?" So I had to explain to them what they were, and. Um, you know, I said, uh, is it okay if I go through the you know the detector with these on? And they're like, I don't know, let's try it. So myself and six TSA agents walked through the uh, security and I made it through uh, unscathed. It didn't trigger anything, and so they said, I guess you can wear them. I don't know if that's their official policy, but I think it's noteworthy that you know, here we have a, a government agency or a group that's really not uh, prepared for this tsunami of new technology that's coming out with the wearables, whether it's smart watches or Google Glasses. And also, with some of these interfaces, are becoming so simple. I've had everybody from children to people in their 80s try and Google Glasses, and within five minutes, they are able to get them to do almost all the functionality uh, with the interaction, with using the voice commands and getting them to um, do, you know, record video, take photos, all the things. So they're much more easier. So it's making them more accessible. Also, when I travel to them and talk to people in the streets. I don't think that uh, college students and uh, early adopters are necessarily going to be the people that will be the first to have these. They're sort of the usual suspects. The, the, many of the people that are fascinated, fascinated by these technologies are people who are working with their hands. They really need to be hands-free, whether that's um, somebody in the airport who's you know, moving baggage around and handling it. You know, instead of trying to do their job well, talking on the phone or having it out, they can now do it hands-free. So I think we're going to see a lot of different Audiences adopting this, so maybe it'll be seniors, maybe it'll be um, you know other other folks than the usual suspects, and, and you you as well in the audience and those viewing online. So our, our next uh, team that's going to be starting out to present is Bou Ballet. Hi everyone, my name is Erin. Um, my team and I helped develop an app called Food Ballet. Um, so we all love to dine out, but one of the downsides of going out to eat is that sometimes you are left out in the cold waiting for a table to open. So Food Valet is trying to eliminate that problem by um, allowing users to simply take a picture of the exterior of the restaurant you want to go into, and the app will help bring users um, approximate wait times along with a live stream of treats so you know how the service is. Um, a picture of the menu so you can look at the prices, and it would just really help the um, experience to dine out. So um, another option for Food Valet would be to take a picture of the street sign you're on, and it would help you find restaurants that are nearby and help bring you to them. Um, so that's what Food Valet has been up to. Um, please follow our all of our uh, social media. We're on Instagram, Google+. Plus. Pinterest, um, you can follow along with our hashtag food ballet. Um, thank you so much for your time. Hi, I'm Katie, and the app I'm presenting today is GoFind. 
Who here has misplayed something in the last two days? In the last week? Even the last month? <laughs> well, we're only human. So, and it was so easy for us to misplay something just every single day. Our memory can fail us or stutter. But with GoFind, it will always be on. GoFind acts as an augmented reality, or an augmented memory, that helps aid your own. It recognizes where you misplaced and, uh, your, your lost items. And it helps you retrace your steps to find them. Uh, it's, meant, it's not meant for the average user. It's meant for busy professionals and students who don't have time to go back and retrace their steps to find their lost items. That will just cause stress to their day, and our mission is to relieve them of their headaches using GoFind. Thank you. Everyone. I'd like to start today by telling you about a young boy that I've been working with since he was in kindergarten. A young boy named Aiden who has Asperger's syndrome, which is an autism spectrum disorder. When he was in kindergarten, he was in a self-contained classroom and he had a really hard time focusing on lessons, interacting with others, and having a positive social life. Now Aiden is in eighth grade and it's even more important than, more important than ever for him to be able to interact with others since he's no longer contained. He goes to classes like everyone else. He goes to his locker between classes. He goes to lunch and has to interact with others. So Puzzle Glass is a Google Glass app that my team has been developing that will help autistic children interact with others in a positive way. With Puzzle Glass, Aiden would be able to take pictures, take videos throughout his day and store them in a video memory bank that he could later take to his special education teachers and have them help him sort through complicated issues. He could also share videos with other people through social media and take use of built-in video tutorials dealing with common difficult situations for autistic children. Autism is a very serious disorder that affects 1 in 88 children, so an app like this could have a real impact on a very serious problem for a lot of people. If you're interested, please look up our hashtag, hashtag PuzzleBlast, on Twitter, Google Glass, and Facebook, and we really look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie, and I'm here to present to you Race Blast. So how many of you are runners, bikers, or racers of any kind? All right, awesome. Well, if you're like me, you probably get really annoyed at constantly having to fidget with all your clunky gadgets, your iPhone apps, as you're careening down the road. It's dangerous, you could trip over a squirrel or something, right? So we have designed an app that makes it a lot safer for you to run. And this is Race Labs. It gives you all your stats, your distance, your pace, your time, your incline on a tiny screen so you can keep your eyes on the road at all times. In addition, Race Labs gives you your location on your route, whether it's a training run or a race at all times. And it provides you the locations of other racers and finishers in an event. The social function of Race Class allows you to see a streaming Twitter feed of encouragement from family and friends that can help to boost your performance on some of those longer legs of a race. Uh, this also can be heard uh, with using the Google Glass system as well as read on the screen. And um, it will also automatically tweet when you finish an event. So all your followers can uh, congratulate you both virtually and in the physical realm. So with all of these functions, uh, it's pretty easy to race safe, race social, race last. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Diana Deeg, and I'm here to present Fashion Check. Fashion Check helps with fashion designers, PR um, executives, and designers to aid with sending sample requests, booking studio appointments, and collection feedback. This feedback is very important to fashion designers as they need this information to know which clothing items made a hit on the runway or not. So you simply just take a picture when you sit at the runway, send, an, um, send a message to the designer or the PR executive, and they get this feedback automatically. It helps in making Fashion Week much easier as you don't have to fight tooth for nail at the back, the backstage of the fashion show just to get this information back to them. So this is Fashion Check, making Fashion Week so much easier. If you'd like to know more information or you'd like to give some feedback, you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag Fashion Check. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, quick question. How many of you guys have either Instagram or some sort of photo app on your smartphone? Awesome, cool. So Vintology is obviously a Google Glass app, and basically what Vintology is going to do is any location that you're at, GPS location will show you the um, oldest available picture of that spot, what it used to look like. As you can see, that tiny example up there, that's the armory building that I live in. And in the top right corner, this is what Google Glass would do. It would show you that old picture. And you can scan into that further and get some great information on that. Um, so as I said, Google Glass app, Ancestry.com for buildings, a wearable history lesson. And what we'd really like to say is that Vintology is the future of the past. So it's going to be a great app. And thank you for listening. <laughs>
I tried to fly it over the summer. There's plenty to go out and do things outside. Um, totally failed at it. I found out that the learning curve for that particular device was really difficult. Um, came back with my tail between my legs. And then I got the news uh, in the fall that uh, some other universities, University of Nebraska, University of Missouri, that their drone journalism programs were being essentially shut down by the FAA. Uh, what you may not realize is that uh, in the United States, at least, uh, the FAA, while they've been mandated by Congress to, um, to provide a method for certifying commercial uses of drones, um, and the, these are drones, but people often think of, I mean, what we, what we call drones here, I mean, really, we're talking about FedEx delivering packages uh, with uh, unmanned area vehicles. I mean, they go kind of all the way up to that. So the FAA is kind of looking at those problems, but if, if uh, you is a commercial entity, which could be, let's say, your professor were to go out and actually shoot some video and publish it, FAA will send you a letter now um, uh, uh, saying that they're going to fine you $10,000 if you don't stop, and uh, also uh, basically that uh, you're, you're breaking the law, you can be subject to civil and criminal penalties. Now, let's say that you're not doing this for commercial use, that you're just a guy who's doing things on his own with his own equipment, which is far than here. So I, uh, that's actually completely legal. Um, so I came back from the summer, and thanks to Jay, uh, who was interested in drones as part of the independent study, he met Arlen and said, oh, there's this, this guy who's done all this amazing stuff with drones. I don't know if you're going to bring the video up, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of let you take it from here. Um, Arlen's is somebody who uh, is really on the cutting edge of this technology. Um, he is an expert drone pilot, and uh, I mean, as far as you can be an expert these days. Um, and uh, to kind of make a long story short, uh, we went into the dome, a couple, I'm sorry, the dome, the Manly Fieldhouse a couple weeks ago, and uh, I'll let Arlen explain it now, so, or are we going to fly? Well, um, I'll fly. Okay, all right, so there's Arlen Woodfield. Hey guys, my name is Arlen Woodfield, so thanks for the introduction there. Um, and uh, I'm just kind of here to talk to you guys about what I did this summer, um, as well as kind of what these are and what, what they can do and how powerful they can be. Um, today, drones is a very, very scary word for a lot of people. And it's, it's kind of part, part of my initiative, which stemmed from the summer, to come out and educate people so they understand that we really need to be like, turning a blind eye to this awesome technology if we just ignore what the FAA is doing right now, banning it. And that, that's wrong, and this, this technology needs to be seen and explored. And um, Dan's been doing a really awesome job, getting a lot of exposure, getting out there. And this, this test flight, Manly, Manly Fieldhouse, um, really showed that that idea. Um, and he, it was kind of like a, a fusion of like media and technology, and it all came together, and it, it really produced some really neat results. And I'll, I'll do a little reel here that uh, in-house Erin uh, Miller uh, put together for us. She did an awesome job. Yeah, Aaron, where yeah, Aaron, why don't you stand up for us? You stand up. So uh, this is a really what, what I love about the student drone organization, which has a name, which is yeah, the Skyworks Project. The Skyworks so, Project. A bit. They come from across the university, from pretty much all the major schools, and hopefully we'll, we'll see that continue. So yeah. it's a really great example of, of uh, you know students working across uh, the border from you know with people who have really different interests and different uh, uh, different so, skill sets. So uh, Aaron shot the video. There's uh, Lenny Christopher. I'm not sure if he's here, but he's an MPE department here in Newhouse, and he got some still photos. We got Arlen and Jay from high school. There's an engineering student named Yukti who's actually working to, uh, uh, to put facial recognition software into drones, which she did in high school in India, by the way. So it's really, really exciting. So um, but I just want to recognize all of you who were part of that student body. I just think you're really inspired. Yeah. I'm so this. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks for that, Aaron. Well, I, um, I, I, I want to talk about some of this technology because this is about the, the body becoming a computer and there, that such. And um, as you can see on the front of this one, uh, there's a camera which we use to kind of film what's going on. And that's what you saw most of that play that it's from. But above it, there's a, it's kind of dark, but you can kind of see right here. Um, it's a little like security camera. And that, that goes to a 5.8 gigahertz uh, transmitter, which goes to a pair of glasses or goggles that I wear. Um, and it, you saw in the video, they're right here. Um, and this, this streams all the uh, video from the actual thermal to my eyes. And when, when I'm flying this, it's you really become kind of where whatever this drone is in space. It feels like you're flying. It feels like you're there. Um, and it, it allows for like very unique opportunities. Um, I think Dan was talking about this before, where um, you know people are able to use it to like fly and experience the world like they haven't before. And like um, it, it's it's a really unique opportunity and unique combination of technology because. All the night we've been talking about how to interact with the virtual space. But this is the this is kind of the reverse. We're taking, you know, what's out there, what's out there already, and putting, you know, us as the computer, as the, the entity in the foreign area, which is is an interesting concept, I think. So um, if you guys want to find out more about what these are and you know what technology is behind them, we have uh, we started a club called the Skywars Project. And this is basically the initiative to bring together uh, the best writers from like every you know sector of the school, so law students and engineering students and high school students and Newhouse students, bring together all those ideas and thoughts and create something that's actually never been seen before. Explore what we can do with these because they have applications in almost every industry, and we really need to turn a blind eye to just ignore it. So, um, if you want more information about any of this, you can come and visit me here. I'm actually gonna fly really quick, and then um, I guess afterward uh, I can get your emails where if you're interested in joining. Um, so I'll fly that really quick. Everyone could just stay seated too. <laughs> Don't be like rushing towards the propeller. It's the flying lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> Don't charge. Them. Or if you want to move, move now. <laughs> Thanks. So now uh, I'd like to uh, invite everybody to you can go over to uh, down into the left. There's some uh, cookies. We've got about 100 cookies. I think there's at least one for everybody. Uh, there's some sign-up forms, as, as you mentioned. And then uh, we're going to be setting up in little stations here so that you can spend some time with each of the innovative groups. And uh, thanks so much for coming. And uh, look forward to the next event. And if you want to know about the next event, remember, go to the poll. Survey monkey, which I will then put up on the screen here. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I mean, this is just like a